Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my standard review of the new Canon EOS R6 full-frame mirrorless camera. Now, this camera, of course, was released um, basically alongside the EOS R5, the higher resolution, you know, big brother of this camera. But in many ways, even though this is operating at a very different price point, the R5 comes to market in the U.S. at around 3,900 U.S. dollars, almost 4,000 dollars. The uh, R6 runs more at about 2,500 U.S. dollars. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the wrap up, but obviously that is a radically different uh, price point, and so a lot of market separation between these two cameras. Despite that, however, there is a lot of goodness in the R6 that uh, it inherits, you know, alongside the R5. And we'll do our best to detail those things here today. Now, if you want a more thorough comparison and also more thorough details, check out the definitive review. Today, however, we're going to hit the highlights and give you a breakdown of what you're getting here with the R6. So starting with taking a look at the physical design here. What you have here is a camera that is very similar in size to the R5. In fact, the exterior dimensions are they're near identical. There is a little bit of difference in the weight. This camera is a little bit lighter. It comes in at right under 600 grams versus about 650 grams. And that's primarily because the body here is made more of you know, the polycarbonates as they call it. So more plastics in the body, less of the magnesium alloy that we see in the R6. And uh, it's still a very, you know, well-built, durable camera. However, you know, just a little bit different materials in the construction. There's also a difference in the degree of weather sealing, according to Canon at least, where the R6 has like a 60, 60 series degree of weather sealing. So good, and I would say probably, certainly, probably even better than what we find in maybe the Sony a7 III, for example. And so a, you know, a, a good level of weather sealing, but not as high as the R5, where it has a 5D series. Uh, you know, amount of weather sealing, more of a professional grade build. But what you've got here is a nicely built camera. It does feature, uh, like the, R, the R5, it has a great articulating LCD screen, which you can, you know, flip forward for forward monitoring. And that's very, very handy. I'm looking at one of those on the R5 at the moment as I film here. But in this case, we've got a slightly smaller three inch screen with a little bit lower resolution, 1.62 million dot compared to, I believe, 2.08 million dot and a slightly larger 3.2 inch screen on the R5. You also have a little bit lower resolution, the actual uh, physical opening of the viewfinder and uh, the overall magnification is identical with the R5, but the resolution is lower overall, 3.68 million dot compared to 5.76 million dot on the R5. Like the R5, however, you do have the ability to go into a high refresh rate, 100 and, uh, 120 hertz, I believe, refresh rate that gives you very close to an optical viewfinder in terms of the naturalness of movement. And so it's a great thing to engage when you're doing tracking, for example. Just note that there is a little bit more battery drain that is associated with that. And so I would you know, recommend that you kind of use it as needed, not leave it, leave it on all the time. Speaking of that battery capacity, like the R5, we have the new LPE6 in series battery. It has somewhere around 14% higher capacity. And so, you know, the rating is higher here than what we see on the R5 in terms of the overall battery rating. It's rated at 380 shots for using the viewfinder, a little over 500 if you're using the LCD. Most people experience though is that you're going to get a much higher amount of shots in than that. And so I don't think about it maybe necessarily all that much. I don't do a whole lot of just all day shooting. Your photography style may be different. You know, you may be a, you know, doing a lot of wedding photography or event photography. And so you go through the batteries more quickly or you shoot a lot of video. And so of course, you know, you're aware of your needs. And so this, this camera I think is, it's about average for mirrorless cameras these days. So that extra bit of capacity does help, as does the fact that it has a little bit less processing needs relative to the R5 and its higher resolution. Beyond that, the only real noticeable physical difference here, I mean, you know, on the front of the camera, it doesn't have the three pin uh, remote release cable. Instead, it has the standard 2.5 millimeter, which is smaller and more compact on the side. So the only thing that you lose there is the flash sync uh, cable. 
Probably most people don't miss that these days. I suspect that many people will use wireless for flash triggers if you're doing that. And so it's kind of a legacy feature, but the R5 has it, this camera does not. But as I noted, the big physical change is on the top plate where you don't have the LCD screen and instead you have a typical mode dial. Now, as far as choosing modes, I, the mode dial is still the most logical way to do that. The advantage, obviously, of the, you know, the LCD screen is more for other things, an extra source of information and feedback. If you're doing long exposures, whatever, there's certainly value to that. But as far as actually selecting a mode, I actually prefer this method because it's just very straightforward and, and quicker. It's not a two or three step process like what you see on the R5. And so, you know, the only other thing I do want to point out is that while the button's in the same position, the uh, video record button is just situated in such a way where it's a little harder to access. It needs a little bit more of a pointed kind of direct activation. And because it's winter right now and I'm wearing gloves often when outside, I'm actually finding it hard to do that. So the workaround for that is if you go into the menu settings, you can change the behavior for the shutter button during video recording. And if I just set it up to where if you do a full depress, it will start or stop video recording. It's a, it's a more effective workaround if you're working where you need to ha actually have gloves like myself. Beyond that, however, ergonomically, this camera is fantastic. It feels great in the hand, has a fabulous grip. You know, unlike many mirrorless bodies, I don't feel like I need to add a grip extender to it and so I can hold the camera naturally. And so I really like that. It has the rear kind of five series uh, dial on the back two other control dials and that combined with the you know control dial on the RF lenses gives you four different control dials which allows you to just map a lot of um, you know behavior to that you can customize other buttons it does have the joystick and so just in general it's a really really great camera ergonomically and and so I give it high marks for that also give it very high marks for the development of the in-body image stabilization that we see here like we see in the uh, R5. It's a very effective system and it does behave a little bit better than what I have seen from competing systems. Uh, it's, it's rated higher by SEPA, but also you can just feel like you get a little bit more stability. There are still practical limits. You know, Cam, uh, Canon says that, for example, in this combination, I've got the 24 to 70 f2.8 LIS. And so it's saying that, you know, between the lens stabilization and the camera stabilization, you should be getting up to eight stops of stabilization. I don't see that happening in the real world. You know, case in point is I took this shot at 70 millimeters and I was able to, out of about three tries, to get what would I would consider an acceptably stable shot at 0 0.5 seconds. So, you know, a half second exposure. Now, theoretically, you know, under those same conditions, a full eight stops would allow me to shoot like an over three second uh, exposure handheld. And that's just not happening at least for me, uh, maybe you have like, you know, rock solid hands, but for me, that's not happening. I'm getting, I would say between five and six stops of stabilization, which is still fantastic. I'm not complaining at all. I just think that the marketing is maybe a, overselling it a little bit. And I would also note that while the IS is fantastic for just holding stable shots or, um, you know, like here you can see in this landscape, that's handheld, that's very, very stable. Uh, you can also see, um, you know, if I'm doing slight panning type shots, very good for that. But if you're actually doing kind of walking and that kind of movement, as you can see from this footage, you know, even if I, you know, smooth it out by its 4K 60 footage, and so I drop it down to half speed or slow it down, uh, you can just see it's not as smooth as what it's going to be with a gimbal. You know, and there's no in-body image stabilization that I've seen that really gives you gimbal type results and those more, more challenging type settings. But, I mean, obviously it's great to have it, and I love that, you know, I even threw on a vintage SMC Tacumar 50mm f1.4 via actually two adapters to make it work. But I was able to get stabilization. I shot this, this shot at 1 40th of a second, and, uh, you know, it's nice and sharp and looks great. And so, anyway, I, that's the, the advantage of in-body image stabilization is it typically works for everything. And, of course, you're able to manually input your, uh, your focal length if you don't have electronic communication. So, you know, a lot of great things there. Kudos to them on that. 
Also, huge kudos when it comes to the focus system here. Like the um, R5, you have basically the identical focus system. It's got the learning focus. It's got point spread all across the frame, 100% coverage of the sensor. And, and so as a byproduct of that, it just tracks amazing. Whether you're doing IAF for humans or animals, you can see that, you know, I just again and again, as you move around or the subject moves around, it just stays locked on the eye, it gives very reliable results. That's true for photo or for video. And as you can see from this footage, I mean, the R5, which has the same focus system, just does a flawless job of tracking my face without any kind of, you know, moving around. But beyond that, you have, of course, the option of 12 frames per second with the mechanical shutter and, and a deep buffer of with that well over 200 even raw images. And, and, you know, and if you're shooting JPEGs, basically no limit to that. But then you also have the option of going to an electronic silent shutter and getting 20 frames per second. And I found that whether I was tracking with the mechanical shutter or the electronic shutter, the tracking was pretty close to flawless. It just, it makes it really, really easy. It locked onto my subject in this case you know my fast moving little king charles cavalier spaniel and you know and so she's very dark around the eye so she is a challenging subject but yet i went through you know hundreds of these shots frame by frame and in almost all cases i would say i maybe had three percent of shots that weren't perfectly focused uh, and that may even be a high statistic but in many complete you know sets of 60 frames Every one of them was perfectly focused. And so I'm really, really impressed by the focus system. You also have enhanced sensitivity, even better than the R5, since it's not saddled with the high resolution and all the processing for that. And so sensitivity is down as low as minus six and a half EV. Uh, that's with an F1.2 lens. And so in that kind of setting, I mean, you, you can't really even hardly see your subject and the camera is, is seeing it, which is was truly impressive. And also, you know, you have the ability to use very small uh, maximum aperture combinations, you know, like these new F11, F11 600 millimeter lens. And you can use that and a two times extender um, and still have autofocus, you know, and it's a, it's a maximum aperture of like F22 or smaller. It's just ludicrous, but you're still able to autofocus. And so that's really, really impressive. It's an amazing autofocus system. And I think that it is the biggest built-in advantage relative to competing cameras. This has the best autofocus system um, of, of any of the competitors that I've used. Finally, as we talk about the image quality, the image quality here, the sensor is a 20 megapixel sensor that is borrowed, translated here from the 1DX Mark III. And so it is, that sensor is one of Canon's best existing sensors. Now the R5 got a brand new sensor that in some metrics actually rates a little bit higher, dynamic range being one. But the, this sensor here is one of Canon's best. And frankly, even though 20 megapixels is on the low side of what I would like to see as far as resolution, uh, the, I would definitely prefer this sensor compared to the 24 megapixel full frame sensor found in either the RP or the 6D Mark II. This is a better sensor. It's, it's cleaner, has better dynamic range, uh, better high ISO performance. It's just a better sensor, period. And so there are a lot of good things here. First of all, it is amazing in low light, not just for focus, but the native ISO range is 100 to 102,400. And I would say you can go all the way to 51,600 and get pretty clean results all the way through that. Now, I don't recommend using one at 102,400. I, I find that basically the last stop of uh, high ISO performance in most cameras is more for marketing. I would say that's true here. You lose a lot in that final stop, but right up to 51,600, it looks really, really, or 51,200, I should say. It looks impressively good. And, and so anyway, I, I, it's probably, if not the best that I've ever used for low light, it is very close. So impressive on that front. Definitely better than the R5, even with the R5 uh, down sampled to the same native resolution here. It's definitely, a, I would say, about a stop better for ISO performance. Now, as noted, the R5 sensor has a little bit of an advantage for dynamic range, but it's, it's small enough that I think you would really have to have images side by side 
to uh, come to that conclusion. And even when I had that, that privilege, I had to really look at a pixel level to notice differences. And so dynamic range, I think, is competitive. Uh, it's According to uh, some, you know, those that chart test this that I've looked at, it's a little bit better than, say, the Nikon Z6, just a little bit behind the uh, Sony a7 III. And so, you know, it's, it's competitive. It's in the market for that. As far as the resolution goes, I, you know, there's enough resolution there. Actually, images are really, really nicely detailed at a pixel level. There just isn't as many pixels to play with. And so I think you're going to most notice the lack of resolution if you have to deeply crop in an image, and then you might end up with less pixels. You know, for example, if you use the APS-C mode, which you can on this camera, that's a 1.6 times crop factor when it comes to, you know, Canon and, and so that leaves you with a, I think, 7.7 .7 megapixels of resolution. You know, that's not a lot to work with, though, truth be told, most things are shared these days on the Internet are not shared at, at very high resolutions. And so it may be plenty for your work. You're going to have to make that determination for yourself. But images are beautifully detailed, have that great Canon color, and, uh, you know, there's a lot to appreciate there. The same is true of the video footage, which the footage itself looks very good. You can film up to 4K60. I noted in my definitive review that there are very few areas where Canon seems to have just intentionally crippled this camera to create market separation. I'm really uh, thankful for that because some of the things that Canon does just really leaves you scratching your head. There is one of those head scratching things though, and that's when it comes to video. In video, you have an option of the two extremes as far as the modes you can use for capturing. One of those extremes is full program auto, and the other is fully manual. No AV, you know, no TV, nothing in between. It just seems like a weird, arbitrary thing to limit. And so, you know, you'll have to find workarounds for that. Some people do it through auto ISO, um, you know, so your mileage may vary. But, you know, you do get up to 4K 60, not as high as the R5, obviously, but relative to competition, those are very good figures. The footage is very good and crisp. You do get C-Log. You do get um, the ability to shoot HDR footage. And so there's a lot of good things there. The negative, of course, is when it comes to the overheating of the camera. And while it's not as pronounced as it is on the R5, mostly because it's not going to as demanding a resolution as the R5, you still are going to have that issue to where there is a limit of how long you can shoot before the camera will overheat. Firmware updates have helped somewhat with that. I haven't run into it myself, but just note that that could be a possibility. And where I think most people have actually run into a real world issue is if they're doing a, a lot of both. You know, they're shooting both video, they're shooting stills, they're going back to shooting longer format video. It can be cumulative, and so heat builds up in the camera. And, and so then, you know, there comes a point that if it hits that, you know, heat shut off, you have to turn it off and leave it off for a while to allow it to cool. And, and so, again, I haven't experienced it, but plenty of people have. It is a real issue, but it's only a real issue for those that are very, um, you know, video intensive. Most photographers tend to take a lot of stills and shoot video clips. If that's you, you'll never have a problem. I've shot a number of longer format video episodes, you know, where I shoot for, you know, 25 straight minutes on camera. I haven't had a problem, but, you know, your usage, you need to evaluate based on your actual usage. At the end of the day, however, I think that the greatest challenge for this camera is going to be the fact that it is more expensive than most of its competitors. It's a brand new camera coming to market, and it does have a number of real advantages, I believe. However, you know, a price tag of $2,500 US dollars, a lot of it, the competing cameras, say the, you know, the Z6 or the a7 III from Sony, those cameras are now uh, available for well under $2,000. People that are in this, you know, particular price bracket, they're less often to be working professionals, more likely to be amateurs. And so, you know, they're very careful on how they're spending their money. And so I think that Canon has a challenge of, of the perception of where you've got a camera at full MSRP that's competing with cameras that have been discounted due to market forces. So that may be a challenge, but I can tell you this, there are really relatively few flaws in this camera. It's ergonomically great, autofocus is incredible, the in-body image stabilization works great, and the image quality is very, very good. It is a fantastic camera and a great action camera. If you've never been able to afford a 1DX, you're getting a lot of 1DX goodness 
in this camera right here at a much lower price point. So definitely worthy of your consideration. I'm Dustin Abbott. If you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review. You can also take a look at the image gallery where I've got a lot of photos there. There's also uh, buying links if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. And beyond that, of course, linkage to follow me on social media, to become a patron, or to sign up for my newsletter. It comes out every Thursday. And of course, beyond that, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button and ring that bell to get notifications right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.